My name is Barbara Duvalka, and I am a trustee here at the Woodstock History Center. It's a pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Roy Bates, who will be discussing the coal region's research in the Canadian Arctic, Greenland, and parts of Vermont over the last 50 years. Roy completed his bachelor's degree in the physical sciences at the University of Oklahoma and studied meteorology at Penn State University. He's worked as a manager at Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory, also known as CREL, and has 30 years of experience as a meteorologist for many winter field experiments, studying the effects of winter weather on Army materiel, including sensors and smart weapons that are deployed on the battlefield. He also served a five-year appointment to the World Meteorological Organization and has authored or co-authored over 100 technical articles on meteorology, climatology, and snow and ice properties. Before I turn the floor over to Roy, a special thank you to each of you for joining us here at the History Center. I hope you'll enjoy this evening's program, which promises to be extremely informative. Please give Roy Bates a warm welcome. Well, I want to welcome you, and the first thing I want to do is mention my wife, who stood by many years while I was on travel in the Arctic and you name it. Uh, I figured up one time, and it was just a little under a third of the time I was on travel, somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, this slide, start with this one, is... Krell was asked to establish where coal regions was because the other labs, the four core labs and the other three labs had established working territory. The uh, Waterways Experiment Station in uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi was responsible for the waterways in the country and you know, they had the Searle which is the Construction Engineering Research Center in uh, Illinois, near Scott Air Force Base with military construction. And of course, uh, then there was the Topographic Remote Sensing Lab at Fort Belvoir in, uh, near Virginia. So we got a call from a Corps of Engineers saying, where's Krell's working area? So. My boss, a guy named Michael Bellello and myself, got assigned the task of establishing where we thought coal regions was. So we took four parameters, and line A is the Arctic and subarctic, and uh, that was the zero degrees Fahrenheit average temperature during the coldest month, limit of discontinuous permafrost, uh, zero degrees in January, mean average temperature and two feet of snow depth. This line B, where we bit off some territory, maybe other labs were operating in, but this was one foot of frost penetration. Uh, one year in 10, and also uh, zero Fahrenheit, oh yeah, 32 degree Fahrenheit during January, the coldest month and one foot of snowfall. And we did this, of course, Alaska was in all areas. And over here, uh, the line dips down into Europe, across here, across uh, Russia, and through China. Now, we had to corral all the data to present this. Of course, there wasn't any computers or anything, so everything had to be done manually. And right in the middle of it, and my boss, Mike Bolo, went off to McGill to get his master's degree. So I was stuck with the bulk of the grunt work. And uh, we finally determined this was the average of those parameters and presented it to the Corps of Engineers in Washington, and they bought it. Uh, later on, I'll point this out while the map is here, but across the United States, we had field sites in, uh, near Ethan Allen, Grayling, Michigan, and, uh, 
and that was about, I guess we had one in uh, north of Quebec City. And uh, we, uh, these test sites were snow test facilities, and we provide all the background data. I had a team set up the meteorological stations, and all the contractors came in to test their sensors in cold and snow, snowfall, snow with fog, and you name it. And we had contractors from Grumman and Lockheed, Honeywell, you name it. They all came in. They all brought their vans in. Night Vision Lab also from uh, near Washington, D.C. And we had a test that went on. Well, anyways, the first test, I'll just tell you one little funny story. They had, they'd captured a Russian tank in one of the uh, Iraqi wars with the middle, in the Middle East. Israel had them. And they had a, one of those was permanently in Michigan at, Lake, at Camp Grayling, and one was in Washington, D.C. So with all the other targets we had, U.S. targets, tanks, and everything, we had a Russian tank. Anyways, it was sent up down here near Fort Belvoir, up to Ethan Allen near Burlington, by the low bidder, who was Santa Claus Trucking, <laughs> which is a minority company. The, the story the end this out, it broke down on the way back at uh, near the uh, rest area on the interstate up near Randolph, had a cover on it, and they, they called the National Guard headquarters, and the general came down and saw it. People had stripped the tank, and they, it was all classified. They had taken photos of it and everything else. And uh, I don't think Santa Claus trucking hauled much for the government anymore, but some of our higher-ups and people in Washington got in trouble. And uh, then there was some other tests that were over in Germany. I went to Germany three or four times, place in England to their Royal Signals lab north of London and Norway uh, in, in uh, assignments I had while they were testing smart weapons at NATO and other countries over there. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Now this, I'll give you some local stuff first. This was in 1976. And we had some, maybe Charlie remembers, we had some extreme, extreme snow, uh, snowfall, and we had a rain on snow event, which broke the ice up. And high water in Woodstock, out where I used to live on Maple Street, came right down in the middle of the road. But the, uh, this was just from Tassville down to Queechee Lakes Golf Course, where this bridge was. Show me the next slide, please. This was that bridge the next day when the ice went out of the Ottaquichi. It was thicker in the pond in Tassville, it held it back a while. And it came down, took that bridge out, and uh, See, so in, in a river, when you have an ice jam, it is solid all the way to the bottom, all the way to shore to shore with ice. And that's what, where the water has to have some place to go, so it goes over the top. Next slide, please. And this is what, this floated up on the Queechee Lakes Golf Course and shows you the jam. You can see just how it's jammed in. This guy was working, I was working with him mainly. He, He's an international expert from New Zealand on ice and snow, PhD, and uh, he was at the lab, but he, he was always chasing uh, ice jams when they occurred. Really an international expert named Tony Gao. Next slide, please. And here's what it looked like when everything went out, but you can see this is down here in Beaver Meadow down here below the sewer plant. That's where it was rafted up, below the tass above the Tassville Pond. Next slide, please. This is some work uh, we did on Mount Washington. And we was, it was studying, I wasn't on this project, but we were studying uh, icing effects top of Mount Washington, the highest wind speed area in uh, North America at uh, over 6,000 feet. And that's the type of situation you've got when you had atmospheric icing. Next slide, please. 
And this is a new type of wind sensor that I got a hold of, and I sent it up there with some guys to set it up, see if it worked. It was a hot, 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 hot element uh, wind sensor. And uh, even ice blew into that. Didn't quite uh, make it useless, but almost. The highest wind speed recorded up there, I didn't tell you, it was 239 miles an hour. And that was when the jet stream dipped down and hit the top of the mountain. But not during this time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is another local project. Uh, I'll tell you when I didn't work on them, but Lake Champlain Transportation Company wanted to operate their ferry year-round. They always closed it when ice started to form. And uh, they wanted to make it go year-round from Grand Isle to Cumberland Head in New York. It saved about 70, 80 miles of driving around over North Hero to get to Burlington the other way to Plattsburgh. So they called us, they came down, and we discussed the project with them. Next slide, please. So, that winter, that summer, late fall, they came down to Krell, the ice and air engineering facility with Gunny Frankenstein, developed a bubbler system where they parked the, the boat at night. And you might grow four or five inches of ice overnight, so the bubble system on this side and on the New York side kept, kept it where they could break it ice three, free. And then Krell was asked, what about the structure? And Krell designed a ice breaking, small ice breaking uh, bow to break the ice if you had any problem going across. And uh, they were, had doubts about running it, but it's run ever since 1982. And saved uh, Champlain and Transit Company a lot of money and a lot of travel on people from the area. Most people left a car on each side or they had buddies that left them on each side and they wrote what would it cost at a cheaper price than paying for their car to come across. I have a lifetime pass but I've never used it. <laughs> Next slide please. And this is what deeper ice looks at, looks like. The samples we take with three inch cores. Usually when ice first forms, you get single crystal growth down here in the lower, just so I tell you a little bit about it. And then here is snow, or snow mixed with it, and here is some more ice up here that is actually snow ice. And what happens when your ice grows more, the weight of the snow actually pushes the ice down, and what breaks it, water comes up through and it freezes. That's how you gain a lot of your thickness. And I think that's why the old timers used to think that ice sunk in the spring, but of course that isn't the case. But it will go down some as you get pressure of water again on top. And these samples we took in a lot of areas across the country and out west or anywhere people went, they had a three inch ice auger, they'd bring it down and bring the core back and then they'd do these thin sections at the lab. Next slide please. Just a quick passing look. One day we were going across Niagara Falls, of course, in the winter, wrong time of year. But that's what that looks like with all the froth coming off the falls. I don't want to make any point about this, except maybe most of you have never seen Niagara Falls in the winter. This is all foam ice and everything that's formed from the waterfall over, fall over, the, over the falls. Next slide. Well, we were out at Camp Drum on a test testing the uh, Black Hawk helicopter, which was supposedly a uh, all-weather helicopter with all the infrared millimeter wave sensors and everything. It was number one, but, but uh, they wouldn't fly when they couldn't see the horizon. <laughs> and so uh, we happened to catch a real icing event, atmospheric icing that all be there, so we measure this stuff and we had all the meteorological instrumentation and sensors and everything else so it made a, a neat report on atmospheric icing. Next please. Okay now we're getting into the Arctic. This is uh, up at uh, Resolute Bay. I don't know if any of you you can see it on the map. It's the biggest joint Arctic weather station. 
And what used to happen is, I went on this trek about twice. I went up to uh, Downsville, west of Toronto, and flew to Edmonton with the Department of Environment Canada and their resupply of people for these sites. Uh, we went to Edmonton, and then flew back to Resolute and, uh, in the Canadian Arctic. And uh, then, then we did some work there, and I taught the people there that we're going to be permanent stationed for six months, how to make snow and ice measurements, and send them into our network. There was doctors and dentists and everything else on this. And uh, uh, next slide, please. And these are the kids. They'd see a tourist, and they'd come running. Better have some candy in your pocket. And uh, this is what they looked like, and uh, the Eskimos that were living here. Next, please. This was in uh, Eureka, another Arctic station. And this is a ray dome for taking upper air measurements and a tower, transmission tower. And this, uh, this site was kind of unique. It was right on the Arctic Ocean. And uh, again, it's one of the resupply flights. And we taught people how to make the measurements we needed. And they sent them back to Toronto to the environmental sciences uh, off office and we went on from there. Actually, the Canadians had sites all across the dew line sites. If you know, those were just an early morning sites across Canada. We furnished them information and they got observers to make the measurements we needed. And we gave them five dollars a week for a snow measurement, five dollars a week for an ice measurement. And that went on for quite a few years. At all these sites plus across Canada, across the northern tier, and across to Alaska, of course. Next. And this was another one. Isaacson was a uh, joint Arctic weather station. There was five of these. And uh, we went to there and did the same thing. These are the vehicles we rode around on the ice on. They also had tracks that could be attached. We just go out chasing muskox and caribou just to see them. Next, please. This is a crash. Uh, I think this, yeah, this was at Isaacson. That was in the early days of the Joint Arctic Stage. I bet the plane is still there. Next, please. This is the United States range on the way to Alert, the Northwest Territory. Now, Alert is the most northern tip of land in North America. And uh, that was one of our sites. They had a little more stuff there. They had a, a curling rink and a few other things. The next, please. Here's another one flying up towards Alert. Pretty mountainous region, probably north of 80, 85 north. Next. Of course, Royal Canadian Air Force, Air Force who we were flying with, I didn't, was on the plane when they took this picture. They sump saw something down the sea ice or on the shore. They go down and buzz them with a C-130 or whatever kind of plane they were flying and take a photo. Next, please. Okay, this is that alert. And uh, I ha we had a little effort getting in there one day. We couldn't get in. The weather so bad, and we didn't have enough fuel to go back to Thule, Greenland, or the Resolute for refueling. And we finally went out over the Arctic Ocean and got in. And then we went out touring around the place. And this is a plane that crashed going into Alert. And what happened here was they couldn't get in because of high winds. And they dropped some cargo and some mail and caught on the tail section and killed all seven of these guys. And one of them was the deputy chief of the Weather Bureau for Arctic. Arctic stations. Next, please. Okay, now we're in Alaska. This is a ray dome at Barrow. I was actually in there a couple times in a weather station, and they were another one of our measurement sites. Next, please. Oh, a little bit out of order. That's another one in the Canadian Arctic, but that's all right. Uh, and, uh, no, wait a minute, no, let's, this is also at Barrow, and uh, 
These are some of the vehicles and stuff they were running around with. Next slide, please. And here's another one. This is Kotzebu. Middle of the winter, snow blows in off the Arctic Ocean and really drifts around these buildings and you name it. You had a lot of problems there in the winter with blowing and drifting snow and just general Arctic things. Next, please. Next. Okay, this is in Alaska. Uh, again, this is a tra the pipeline. Comes down from uh, Prudhoe Bay down to Cook's Inlet and Anchorage. It's a four foot pipe and it pumps a lot of oil out of Prudhoe Bay. These stanchions were for holding them up off the ground. I wasn't on this project either. There was a haul road put in here. It's quite a project. These things were refrigerated. These stanchions, so in the summertime, when the permafrost started to melt, they, could, they wouldn't move up and down and move the pipe around. It would move with it and took care of the whole project. Also, some of these were put in where caribou crossings were so that the caribou could get under the pipe and make their annual migration. Next, please. Just a quick slide of some Arctic cotton I'd throw in. This stuff will grow in a month once you get the little sun. Next slide, please. This was uh, this one here. Let's see. Yeah, this is a nuclear sub. I wasn't on this project, but uh, they were surfacing, practicing surfacing, so they could fire their missiles through the ice after they got above the ice. And Krell was there making measurements around. It's all coordinated where they were going to come up. They tried to come up through annual year ice rather than multi-year ice, which was much thicker. Next, please. This is a dew line station on Greenland, and RCA was there, and the uh, Royal Danish people were there, and some U.S. people there, but RCA sort of ran the site. And these were big uh, systems put in to detect missile systems if they were fired out of Russia. Okay, next slide. Okay, before we get into Camp Sentries, one thing I didn't tell you, at all those joint Arctic stations, they had seismographs to record pressure from uh, atmospheric or earthquakes or whatever. And those five seismographs at those stations measured all the nuclear tests at Novoya Shemya in Russia, which were, you could see the curve on, I saw some of the plots, and you could see those curves and uh, when that came in and when it went down when it went out. We were actually at one of these sites only 400 miles from the pole, only about eight or 900 miles from Novoya Shemya, and about 1,500 miles from Moscow. Next, please. This is Camp Sentry now. Uh, this is a nuclear reactor. They hauled in in 19... 61, and they, and they dug these trenches with Peter plows. You know, if you're familiar with them, but they have them out in the west in the Rockies where a lot of snow fills the roads. So they dug these trenches, I'm going to show you more of them with Peter plow. And they hauled this nuclear reactor all the way from Norfolk, Virginia, to Thule Bay, Greenland, and then brought it on bulldozer up the ramp road, across the ice cap 150 miles to Camp Century and installed it for all the power operations at Camp Century. Next slide, please. One of the projects that I was on was a typical type Arctic snow fence. We had a line of them set up, had another place to check the blowing snow and build it up in this particular area because the nuclear waste stretch from the reactor didn't have an arch over it. So it had to be protected all we could, and these would fill the snow, and we had to rise them up and keep the snow off the nuclear waste trench. Next, please. And this is the road into the underground camp, city under the ice, as they call it, Camp Century Greenland. It came down in here through the maintenance trench. 
We were like moles living underground under ice. Next, please. And this was quite a camp set up. They had coolers, they had uh, bathrooms and everything else in here, bunk rooms, research offices, sewage collection tank, R&D offices, research rooms, everything. And about, when I was there, there was about 100 civilians, majority of them from Krell, and uh, s some uh, Army engineers from uh, down around Virginia at Fort Belvere, where the construction research engineering place was. And this would hold 200 people living under the ice. And uh, it was pretty interesting. They had some areas where they could, uh, had air vents, and they had a well that was 200 feet deep called Rodriguez Well with a melter. And everything was just like a miniature army base under the, under the ice. Next, please. This is one of the buildings installed under the trench. You can see the roof arch over the top. And uh, this is probably one of the headquarters, core headquarters buildings, but all of them are like that. They were all dragged out from Camp Tuno, 150 miles by bulldozer, off the ramp road to the access to the uh, ice cap. And arches were put over, and these were installed throughout the camp. Next, please. Of course, GIs being funny people, never was only one woman came to Camp Century. And uh, she was uh, uh, queen of Denmark. She came in and toured the place one day. And of course, these were urine boxes outside of some of the Jamesways. Next, please. And this is what it looked like on the surface. There's a hard-packed runway over here. And uh, you didn't see much on the surface. I uh, came in by helicopter. That wasn't a very good ride. It was 35, 40 below the day I came in. And the door didn't work on the helicopter. And uh, we came in and landed here and were picked up and escorted into Camp Century. Quite an experience. I will mention too that all the equipment was hauled out by bulldozer 150 miles to be installed out here, and most of any of the materials came out that way. This one of these type of helicopters, every Saturday, clergy flew in three or four of them, and uh, when they went back, they got caught in a phase on the way back which is the winds above 20 miles per hour and it disturbed the surface of the light snow up above where you can't see anything. You can't see the horizon, it had an Arctic light out and it crashed and killed for them. Next slide. Okay, here's another project. <coughs> Krell established a deep core drilling program Camp Century ice at Camp Century was 6,000 feet thick. And they'd used a thermal drill, and it pushed down, and these cores come up from the bottom as they drill down. And they drilled clear to the bottom, got every sample of the ice to that 6,000 foot depth, sent it back to uh, Camp Tudor and down to Thule, where they put in uh, boxes with dry ice and they flew them down to McGuire Air Force Base and trucked them up to Krell in the laboratory. So we had 6,000 feet of ice in the laboratory. And there was a guy who developed a drill, worked at Krell, and actually at Century, one of the guys on the drill team, I didn't see him the first week I was there, but he, uh, we were working 12 on, 12 off, and uh, we're getting good overtime. And after 30 days, we got 25% differential. 1962, first time, that was quite a bit of money. But then the technical director of the lab came in, saw we were making more money than he was, so he cut us back to 60 hours. <laughs> <clears throat> but this is quite a project. And then they moved to 
Antarctica and drilled through the Ross ice shelf and all those cores went back to the lab. Next slide, please. And this, when they got down to the bottom, this is a bottom core and they hit dirt at the bottom and uh, brought that sample back. And imagine how old that would be after 6,000 years of compacted ice. And as the snow came on and the ice built up, the lenses got thinner and thinner and thinner. But it could still separate them out because of the solar radiation on the surface. And as they compacted down, they, uh, you find the thin section you could determine every year. But the Navy heard about it at Annapolis. And in 63, I think it was, the graduating class asked for a nice sample when Christ was on Earth 2,000 years ago. So they figured out as close as they could when Christ was on Earth and uh, they sent core back for their graduation and they toasted their graduation champagne with the 2,000 year old core. Uh, yeah. I also mentioned, I was two years here and then I was two years at those subarctic stations up in the Northwest Territory. Next, please. Okay. Uh, this is a uh, uh, South Pole station. This guy wasn't a Krillite, but I just thought you might like to uh, see the photo of the uh, station down there. Next, please. This is me back in 62. <laughs> and I didn't work much. I was in in Met, but I didn't work much in Met, except it was one day a guy sending up the uh, balloons into the atmosphere uh, decided to have a little fun. So they're big radio sound balloons, probably six or eight feet high, so they sprayed, sprayed it with aluminum paint. Uh, anyways, they let it go. Two minutes later, there was two jets from Cooley Air Force Base picked up the signal on the radar there and they came over and uh, they, uh, those two boys went home and then I was assigned to go in here because they were a signal corps out of Fort Belvoir and I worked there for about an, a week until the new people got in. I wanted to show you this tower because uh, for another reason too, you could walk up it you see the braces going out. Well, I walked up it to 100 feet one time, and that was enough. It was instrumented at uh, two multiples and four, eight, 16, and 32 feet to be above the blowing snow and drifting snow. The uh, balloons that went up also had some instrumentation. It was built to sample the ozone layer because the ozone layer at the poles is only seven miles thick and you could get some good information where at the equator the atmosphere is 15 miles thick. So uh, all that data was taken and went back. Uh, further after that, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about Germany. Uh, I was on one test in Michigan and a call came in and they said, uh, uh, Roy, you go home and say goodbye to your wife for a few days. We want you at Dulles Air Force Base to fly on a German transport uh, to a NATO state, land in uh, Germany, and then take go down to a uh, NATO station in Hunfels, Germany. Okay, well, I got over there. That was a pretty good flight, flying with the uh, German military. Landed at Frankfurt. Flew to Berlin, and there was a lot of things going on in Berlin that day. They were all over that airport with machine guns. I was looking for a place to hide, but I didn't have to. And uh, then I flew down to Munich to there, picked up a rental car, and uh, started south down to this Hunfels base. Actually, it was a NATO base called Trappers One Spot. But we had to stay in uh, bed and breakfast. And I got lost in a snowstorm. 
going down there, and I drove up this one pretty good looking road, and it was the border with Austria. And I didn't have a, a visa on my military red passport to get into Austria. Well, happened to be a nice guy there, and he spoke a little English. After he lectured me a while, he straightened me out, called the bed and breakfast. Of course, we didn't have car phones and all that stuff in those days. He got me straightened out down to uh, this, uh, air, uh, this NATO base in Huntsville. And uh, it was actually pretty good, except we had to, they had camouflage on tanks. You name it, they had it. Uh, and it hid the tanks in the trees, and they were looking at them with smart weapons and uh, A-10 jump jets and trying to find them, sample them. They had some camouflage nets. Of course, they were white and brown and some that didn't have them see if they could detect these uh, uh, tanks. And what spawned all this was they got some secret classified information that the uh, Russians had a doctrine. And it spawned Krell into all these tests was that uh, the doctrine was that they would attack at night in a snowstorm. And that was their doctrine. And a few times these tanks massed in on the East German border, and, uh, but they never came over. And uh, it was uh, quite a scene at some of these places. The only good thing about, another good thing about this place, there was a, another little small base that had a real good restaurant. And they served French cuisine and you'd get wine. And they always spent two hours at lunch. Started at seven in the morning, but then they'd have two hours for lunch and then you'd go back to work later in the afternoon. Uh, but uh, this tower right now, the plateau of Greenland is still accumulating snow. Some areas may not be. But this 100-foot tower in 1996 was 70 foot up on the tower with snow. You can see the top of it. So that's about two feet a year from 1962 until uh, 1996. After that, it, I think it either tipped over, wind blew it over, or something. But it uh, uh, shows you the interior of Greenland is still accumulating snow. It is today at the plateau, high elevation, 6,000 feet. There's a lot of water flow at the uh, western Greenland into the Arctic Ocean and eastern Greenland. But uh, they discovered about three years ago there's a lot of geothermal heat from down below the ice cap getting up and melting a lot of the meltwater uh, and forming meltwater pools within the ice cap. So they were, they're still studying what percentage of that runs off is what is coming down from a little bit of uh, climate change that everybody's watching these days. I never like the term global warming because it's climate change. And if you think about it, we've been having climate change ever since the Ice Age when glaciers melted. There's been some delays, like there was some delays in the uh, 1860s to a little before that, when there was some global, not global, climate cooling. This global, global business was started by Al Gore, and he made a lot of money off it, and it cost the government an awful lot of money. Climate change research now is up to about 70 billion a year of U.S. dollars going to climate change. Shows you how they're studying it. Yet, still, we aren't part of the accord on climate change. Yeah. <clears throat> Carl had some of that money because a lot of our scientists, we had 30 to, well, about 30, 35 scientists that were PhDs and uh, another, oh, 70 or 80 civilians. And Carl was the combination of two labs Cypri Snow Ice and Permafrost Lab in Willamette, Illinois, and uh, the uh, 
Ackfield Arctic Construction Frost Effects Laboratory in Massachusetts. They combine them to form Crow. And uh, Senator Prouty of Vermont and Senator Cotton of uh, New Hampshire got Dartmouth to give the land for Crow, and the laboratory was built. And uh, I went over there when it was under construction. I was working in Massachusetts, and I went home on vacation, Joanne and I. And we went over to, I went over and looked at it, and the guy was sitting there on a trailer. Franny would know him. His name was Rodney Poland. And I walked in, and I says, uh, you got any job openings? He says, no, we don't. He said, uh, what's your qualifications? I said, well, I'm in climatology and meteorology. I didn't have my degree at that time. And uh, he gave me an application. I sent it in, and the guy hired me. And it was easy to, uh, when I went to Illinois, he hired me. And it was easy to get to me. I, they gave me a 700-hour appointment. But it didn't last that long, because every scientist or engineer that went there went to Camp Century. And if you didn't want to go there, it couldn't take the, the, the life there, you got fired. So I had the right clearances, secret clearances and stuff for that before I went. And they took me to Century, and I'd only been in Crow that time about six or eight months. And uh, it was quite an experience. And then the other thing Crow did for me, after I started writing some technical reports, uh, they put me in a long-term studies program and I went to the University of Oklahoma and uh, started in 71, was 10 years after I'd been at Crow. Got my degree in 76, the year my son graduated from high school. <laughs> so that's the way that happened with me. And after that, I went into uh, another program the last five years, traveling again. We, I, we had... Uh, 1.8 million dollars to be split by the four labs I mentioned before. And uh, we used to have to go down to either the Pentagon or the Corps of Engineers office and fight how the money was going to be split. And uh, of course the Waterways Experiment Station had two labs that were big, two divisions that were larger than Krell, a mobility and another one. So they'd come in from the Corps of Engineers Chief's office and they'd start talking to us and we'd make our presentations. And I had a division chief at Crow with me. And pretty soon the guy walked out and he says, I'm going to lunch. He says, you guys have it. It's pretty well worked out when I get back. I says, hmm, seems like an old car trick. I used to sell cars too. And I said, and he, and, uh, and he said what do you mean? I says, I'll tell you what. The only reason he left, he expected us to split this up while he was gone, have it done. So I got up, and these guys are all higher power than I was, and I says, all right. I says, Crow will take $1.3 million as our part of the budget. Another guy piped up, and then within a half an hour, he had it all split up with no technical merit. <laughs> That's the way things are done in the, in the government, and I'm sure it still is today. After Krell, I'll just say one thing, a few years before I retired, my good friend Richard Haugen uh, worked at the lab, and uh, he retired before I did, and he, so we decided, he was two or three years ahead of me, so we decided to form this business called Vermont Weather Associates, consulting firm that worked for lawyers and uh, uh, anybody else with a problem, accidental, did a lot of accidental work, and we had uh, lawyers and other people that were hiring us to investigate these things. Well, Franny is Dick Howland's wife, she's here, and uh, she helped us. She was actually a fair editor and helped us along with some of our writing, and because uh, we had to write an engineering letter or some kind of a technical report on each project we had. And we had quite a few projects and did well. I'll just tell you about one, which was very interesting. They were up on sugar bush, putting up towers for me to lot for uh, uh, snow snow lifts, and they were bringing the cement in by helicopter. Anyways, uh, they brought. One of them load in one day, and uh, they knocked two guys off the top of that tower. 
with a bucket when they didn't get a hold of it to dump the, uh, the cement. Well, anyways, we went and investigated it and went around to all the weather stations, went to First Order Weather Station in Albany, and uh, uh, we, I talked to the guy and I said, have any problems on that particular date with anything to do with meteorology? He says, yeah, I looked at it. Flying was banned <laughs> on that day. We weren't supposed to fly anywhere. Anyways, that was the end of the case. And uh, I'll tell you, this lawyer made a lot of money on our findings on that particular case. Of course, he paid us by the hour while he was probably making thousands, you know. And the guy still is in business here in Woodstock. <laughs> And I thought maybe he'd be here today. What's that? He still has some B-Wall business cards. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, uh, Dick died. What year did he die from? 2006. 2006. And uh, that was about 10 years in business. And I kept it going 10 more years. Two years ago, I closed it down. But I did a lot of work after Dick died. Dick was a dendro chronologist. Dendroclimatologist. Dendroclimatologist. And that was study of tree rings and he did that along a tree line in Alaska and then uh, the ice cores is a similar type thing as the tree rings and you could count those all the way back figure out where what year they form yeah. and uh, that's about the end of my talk I don't know if any of you have any questions Yes, Ray. What's the foundation for that tower? How, how deep did it go and what's it made, built on? Oh, no, it was just guide right on the street, maybe three or four feet. Just a little a seat, more. But this was heavily guyed. Yeah. Okay. It's called the Whiteman Tower. The guy that invented it and got it to put up was out of uh, Signal Corps in uh, Washington, D.C. And it's called the Whiteman Tower. Yeah. Anyways, I don't know if Greenland has yet got its sovereignty, if it's under Denmark or not. Okay, the last thing I'm going to say, I guess, is about Camp Century. Uh, we didn't know it at the time, but the National Geographic put out an article on Camp Century. You can get it by going and Googling National Geographic. And uh, Camp Century's in there. But anyways, I found out about it a little before that article came back, probably in the 1990s. But this was really not a research, a research test site, Camp Sentry wasn't. What it was, was the, um, they decided, they see the feasibility of a test site under the ice to launch intermediate missiles. And that's what the experience, experiment was for. Of course, they never did. They even had a trench where they had a little railroad running around testing the railroad because the intermediate range missiles were launched from a railroad. Of course, they'd have to clear the arches. But, and uh, then it listed the people that were staying there were ice worms. And we heard that term. And so we were experimental people that were there at the whim of higher ups, super classified in the army. And Denmark didn't even know that that's what it was for. And finally, the only thing Denmark did at the end of the test, he said, you guys are going to move that nuclear reactor out of there. That's the only thing that was moved, and everything else lays there. That's only moving at the most two or three inches a year, Camp Century, at the plateau level. So it would take thousands of years for it to get to the North Atlantic, but that's all there in the ice. Okay, that's it.